welcome to the uh, introduction to astronomy program here at the Darling County Library. Uh, my name is Jerry Simmons, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, learn a little bit about observing and uh, planning to observe. So uh, to get started, let's uh, take care of some, some interesting things first. Uh, we're joined, uh, as far as the presentation is concerned, uh, by Brian Brangle, one of our star leaders, <coughs> and David Chow, who is a uh, master naturalist. And uh, they have brought telescopes that we can talk about uh, after the PowerPoint presentation. But for the moment, uh, again, one more very important piece of information that we have to get across. We want to make sure that everyone understands this is 2024, and this is the year of the viewing. We want you to uh, have an, an inspiring 2024 as far as telescopes are concerned. Uh, this nice little graphic here was provided to us by the University of Arizona. Uh, I picked it off of their uh, newsletter, and then I called up my friends down at the media, uh, at, at media uh, uh, coordinator at, at the University of Arizona at Stewart Laboratories, and uh, they said that we could use it. So we are uh, using their graphic by, with their permission. Uh, Stewart Laboratories in Arizona makes big telescope lenses. And I have a couple of uh, videos uh, toward the end of the PowerPoint. They're very short, but they tell you how they make their uh, big telescope mirrors. So if you decide that you want to make a big telescope mirror in your garage, uh, you, can, uh, you can learn how to do it. Okay. Let's see what we're up to here. In order to do some planning and observing uh, with your telescope in the night sky, you have to uh, know your scope and you have to know the sky. And putting those two together is what it's all about. So let's look at the different types of telescopes to begin with. We've got a refractor telescope and the refractor telescope uh, we only have one example here. Uh, we have the telescope that Galileo used. Now, Galileo, <laughs> this is not Galileo, this is Brian. <laughs> but uh, Galileo used this scope uh, to just take a look at the night sky and what he observed were bright things, planets, primarily the moon, and most importantly, at the time of Galileo, uh, the Earth was considered to be the center of the universe. He observed that Venus never showed fully, indicating that since Venus was never it was always a crescent. It indicated that Venus was going around the sun. So he came up with the heliocentric model that revolutionized not just only not, not just astronomy, but uh, uh, kind of impacted his life too, because the Catholic Church didn't care for his observations that uh, it was not Earth-centered, that was heliocentric, and uh, ultimately it uh, led to Galileo's demise. But his accomplishments stayed with us. And uh, this is a, a model of, this is a plastic model, this is not a real telescope. <coughs> this is a plastic model, and uh, what I've done is looked at this. The light comes in here, goes through a lens here and goes to another little lens here and that's as simple as it gets. The distance between this lens and this lens uh, 
sets your focus. So if you're looking at something very close, that gets pretty pretty far extended. If you're looking at the night sky uh, with this, say you're looking at the moon, this would have to be pushed in and it simply slides back and forth. I slid it back and forth and made sure that it was looking uh, fairly nicely in the clock. So we can look at that later uh, and time afterwards and uh, see what it goes, see what happens. Now, refractor telescopes were the first type of telescope that was used. And as you can see there, it's a straightforward thing. Light goes in one end, comes out the other. Now, the biggest telescope that was a refractor, and it still is the largest refractor, I believe, is the telescope at Yerkes Observatory up in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. And this is a fantastically large uh, telescope. Uh, the lens is 40 inches in diameter. The tube, in order to use that thing, uh, is oh, from here to that door long. And uh, it's impressive. And of course, it has a nice dome that goes around. and. Uh, the astronomers would sit up there in a chair at the other end. It's now set up to uh, uh, to do things electronically on TV screen, so they can do that and you take the pictures that way and all that. They used to use this with uh, photographic uh, plates. And this was the old photograph plates where you slide the plate in, open the aperture, gather a bunch of light, shut it down, develop the plate, and all of your early science books, those of you who, uh, shall we say, are over 50, may recall that you had pictures in the early science books in your, in your grade school. They had photo credits on every one of those for Yerkes Observatory. So, <coughs> Uh, and they still have tours up there, so you can uh, you can have a little fun visiting Yerkes if you want to. I took our family up there uh, several years ago, five years ago, and they even gave us a nice little uh, private tour. Cool, cool place. So that's a refractor scope. Then you have a reflector scope, which is a Newtonian scope, and the Newtonian scope is neat. Light comes in, bounces off a mirror. It's a, a, a little uh, second, secondary mirror and goes out the side. The advantage of this over, say, a refractor is that the light goes both directions. So the, the, the length of the tube involved is cut in half. <clears throat> if you uh, grind the lens better, you can shorten it up even more. So uh, these are generally all, I haven't looked at this one yet. Uh, I don't think that's a refractor, that's a reflector. But all of these are reflector scopes. This is a Newtonian scope here that, uh, that David brought in, a uh, nice little solid prime. Light comes in this end, bounces off the mirror down here, comes up, gets a secondary mirror and shoots it out the side. It works, and it works well. Let's get to the next thing, which is, well, there's a Newtonian scope that you've all seen, my big red one. That's a 10-inch mirror, <coughs> and we didn't bring it because you've all seen it, if you've been attending these lectures. Cassegrain made a further improvement because you have spherical aberration from the mirrors and the spherical aberration is shown there with uh, uh, the green line and purple line. The light comes in and as it's reflected, it has a tendency to be split up almost like a prism. Not a lot of splitting, 
but enough to mess up your scope. So you have to try and correct for that. And that's the acid rain design. You then go with a matte Stukov, Stukov acid rain, which has a corrector lens to get rid of that spherical aberration. And this is a, an example of a cast grain Maxikov. And uh, that, that corrects for the spherical aberration because you have a little bit extra curvature on your secondary mirror, which is then a corrector lens. Same concept. Light comes in, gets bounced, goes out the side. So, what do we do after this? Well, we do what everybody wants to do. We, we look at things and try to figure out how we can use them. And one of the things that we want to do is to recognize that every one of these telescopes has a focal length. <clears throat> do we care about that? Well, yeah. Because the focal length is basically the, the distance that you have to uh, uh, use to get the lights coming together at a point, bouncing off of the mirrors. What do we want to do with the focal length? Well, I did it for the mean here. This Castrian Matskov. And it has a focal length of 1900 millimeters. Doesn't mean anything to us, except for the fact that it has a focal length of 1900 millimeters. The eyepiece that I put up there to look through will also have a focal length. And if we divide the focal length of the telescope and 1900 millimeters by the eyepiece of, uh, focal length, we get the magnification. So the larger the number of the focal length on the uh, uh, on the eyepiece, the smaller the magnification. You say, well, gee, why wouldn't we just go and get the biggest magnification we can get? Isn't that what we want to do? And the answer is, well, sure, but the, the bigger the magnification, the more difficult it is to find things because your field of view is shrunk. So if you're out hanging out with Brian or Jerry or anybody else out in the woods and uh, you're trying to find things through your telescope at night, you start out with a wide angle eyepiece, find what you're looking for, and then start swapping down until you get a, a magnification that you want. So you can keep switching your eyepieces. <clears throat> or you can do what Brian does, which is, I use zoom eyepiece. You zoom eyepiece. He's got an eyepiece that you can zoom back and forth and uh, works pretty good. Uh, I have one, but I didn't like it. I'm old school, I flop them back and forth. But that's it. So let's go on to uh, the next thing. If you're an amateur uh, astronomer, you want to do something that, well, you want to avoid a condition and that condition is called uh, uh, aperture, uh, the aperture virus. You get one telescope and you want a bigger telescope. <laughs> and then a bigger telescope. And a bigger telescope. Until you get one that you have to buy a new car to put the telescope in. So we... we but we have uh, friends in the United States government who do this for us. So we'll settle for the smaller scopes to look at the moon, planets, and, and deep sky objects. 
This is the Hubble Space Telescope, and it has a nice big mirror. It has a fairly small secondary mirror. The secondary mirror is about that big, and they're lightweight because you want to shoot them into outer space. So the trick is, how do you make something that's big and also lightweight? Uh, one of the answers is that you make the mirror thinner. If you make it thinner, then it's going to be subject to stresses. So you want it to be still rigid, but it's a trade-off. The secondary mirror, on the other hand, in this case, is made of pure beryllium. Very rigid and light as a feather. Beautiful thing. And I held that in my hands out at Perkin Elmer in Danbury, Connecticut one day. Uh, they told me, hey, Jerry, come back here. we got to show you something. I said, okay, what's that? Light as a feather, beautiful. Oh, that. Um, yeah, they're going to shoot that in outer space. Well, the one I was holding didn't end up being used. But uh, it was still in, an interesting uh, thing to do. The, uh, the Hubble School has a couple of features that I want to point out. Uh, of course, in your, if you're in outer space, you need a power source. So you've got all of those uh, nice little solar uh, collectors. Uh, and uh, you also have... Uh, you have to have a, a positioning system. The Hubble uses gyroscopes, and it has uh, a number of different gyroscopes, uh, three in common use, and that's the backups. And the gyroscope holds a position. I don't know if you've ever spun a gyroscope and noticed that it's difficult to, to move it. It resists movement. Well, the gyroscope is what holds to the Hubble in position, and then you can use other uh, devices to point it where you want to point it, just operating against the gyroscopic uh, stability. We also have, always have to get bigger. Okay. The Webb telescope is what you've been hearing about lately. And the Webb telescope is out in outer space and uh, it's sitting at the Lagrange point, L2. Doesn't mean too much to you, except for it's the sweet spot between the gravity of the Earth and the gravity of the Sun. So it's a stable point in space. That's all you need to know. But it's a, mile, a million miles away from the Earth. So we have to uh, account for the distance in communication between us and the web. And they accomplished this quite nicely and they've, uh, they've got magnificent pictures from the web telescope. Okay, a couple of different things here. We'll, uh, we'll let the uh, video tell you about this a little bit later. Uh, the Hubble primary mirror uh, is fairly, fairly small. You look at the size of the person here next to it, and you'll see that the Hubble primary mirror <coughs> is only about eight feet across. Now, each of the uh, uh, James Webb uh, segments is uh, a little bit smaller than that, but together, they work together to give you this wonderfully large thing. You see, uh, you notice that the Hubble is indicated there as white. Well, it's reflecting visible light. The James Webb is gold. And they used gold, literally gold, very thin uh, gold film on the, uh, on the segments because it's an excellent reflector of infrared light. So uh, the the James Webb uh, is not not so much for visible light as it is for uh, other wavelengths, primarily in the infrared range. Now, when they were making it, that gives you an idea, a better idea of the size. 
Uh, and once again, that is from uh, Stewart Laboratories. And uh, when you want to send something like that into outer space, if you want to send something really big, you need a really big rocket ship. If you can fold it up, then you have a smaller rocket ship. The only problem is that once you fold it up, you have to unfold it. And I've got a neat little, uh, very short video on that. Okay. And here is that video. Let me get this for you. Only takes two minutes. Let me know if the sound is okay. More sound? Three days after launch. As you can tell, this is going to be moving very slowly. Next thing to look, look at, see how it works in space, but let's see how those mirror segments were done. So here we've got uh, uh, another video showing the casting process for the Webb telescope. And this is for all of the large mirror telescopes. There are, uh, I'm going to guess, about 20 large mirror telescopes around the world. You've got a couple down in Chile, and the mirror lab tells you about this stuff, you know, this is really nice. But the making of these uh, uh, in the casting process, you're going to see uh, a complex thing where you melt the glass and all that, and then they spin it. The reason that they're doing this is that if you stir a liquid, you'll notice that the liquid, instead of staying flat, gets pushed out to the edges. The amount of spin and the viscosity of the fluid determines the amount of curvature that you get. And uh, a fellow by the name of Roger Angel developed this technique uh, back in the 80s and uh, it's been used to reduce the, the size of these mirrors. Uh, it, it, it eliminates the grinding that you would normally have to, to, to use. If you want to make a telescope mirror and you get a blank, it's a flat piece of glass, you have to make that curvature by grinding it out. So this uh, idea of spinning for the parabolic 
uh, shape. We have uncovered wonders undreamt by our ancestors and first speculated on the nature of those wandering lights in the night sky. No, we won't. We're going to mirror casting. And the mirror casting is there. Let's start this over. This movie will take you through the spin casting of an 8.4 meter honeycomb mirror. This mirror is one of the seven segments of the 25 meter primary mirror for the giant Magellan telescope. Spin casting starts with building a mold. This is the negative of the honeycomb structure. After the mold is built, glass is loaded onto it, the mold is enclosed in an electric furnace, and the glass is melted. While the glass is molten, the mold spins to give the top of the mirror the parabolic curvature that we want. The first part of the movie is a sequence of photos taken one per day during the mold construction and casting of GMT segment two. The mold includes a hard tub made out of silk and carbide cement. We build it on the turntable of a spinning furnace. We first lay down the floor of the tub, then add the walls. It's built like a barrel with staves that are wrapped with steel bands to hold it together. These materials will change their dimensions when they go through the heating cycle. So we install the furnace in pieces and do a preheat to stabilize the dimensions. We do a test spin of the furnace at the same time. Next, we line the tub with ceramic fiber. Install 1,700 hexagonal boxes of the same ceramic fiber. When the glass melts around the boxes, it will create the cavities in the honeycomb. The ceramic fiber is much softer than the glass and doesn't have any chemical interaction with the glass. So it's easy to remove the ceramic fiber after the mirror is cast. Again, we heat the mold in order to stabilize the dimensions before adding the glass. The glass is Ohara E6 borosilicate, delivered to us as irregular blocks. Each block was broken out of a larger piece, so the surfaces are pristine and the blocks melt together without any trace of the original blocks. When the glass loading is complete, we reinstall the furnace and raise the temperature to about 1200 degrees C, spinning the furnace as the glass starts to melt. Now we'll change to a view from one of the cameras mounted in the ceiling of the furnace so we can watch the glass melt. It reaches a thickness like cold honey and takes a few hours to flow down the 12 millimeter gaps between the hexagonal boxes. As the glass melts, it becomes transparent and you can see the hexagonal boxes. You can also see some bubbles of trapped air rising to the top and bursting. Here's a close-up view of the side of the mold from a different camera. The side is marked with the height in inches above the tops of the boxes. We want to finish with a glass thickness of about two inches, and that's where the glass surface stabilizes after it fills the mold. Once the liquid glass is stabilized, we cool it quickly to solidify, then cool it slowly down to room temperature. Most of the cooling is the process known as annealing, when the atoms in the glass get locked into place forever. Temperature variations need to be very small during annealing, and we achieve that by cooling at a rate of three degrees C per day. The whole cooling process takes three months. At the end of that time, we can open the lid, remove the rest of the furnace, remove the silicon carbide tub wall, and we're left with a cast honeycomb mirror. It still has the ceramic fiber trapped inside, and it's still attached to the silicon carbide floor tiles. These will be removed in the next step. In order to remove the mold material, we need to lift the mirror off the turntable and move it into a turning fixture. We use a steel lifting fixture bonded to the top of the mirror with a compliant adhesive and with the load distributed to minimize stress on the glass. Now we'll switch to a different view. 
It's actually a different mirror, GMT segment three, but the process is the same. We'll lift the mirror and move it to the turning fixture. We use the turning fixture to raise the mirror into a vertical plane, giving access to the bottom surface. This transfer takes about a day, so we'll speed it up. Now we'll install the mirror in the turning fixture and lift it up. We'll bring in an enclosure to protect the mirror and contain the mold materials as they're removed. The enclosure holds an elevator platform, so the technicians will have access to all of the rear surface. They first remove the silicon carbide floor of the tub, then they'll wash the trapped ceramic fiber out of the mirror with high pressure water. This completes the casting process. We have a lightweighted honeycomb mirror that is 80% hollow. Obviously, the idea of the honeycomb is that it's very rigid and yet it's 80% hollow. So you make use of the uh, engineering capabilities of our friends of the bees and uh, there you go. Now we have a, a very rigid, lightweight mirror that uh, can be uh, transported uh, with a spaceship. Let's go to the, the uh, next short one, which is mirror polishing. It will pick up where the other one left off. This movie picks up after the spin casting of an 8.4 meter honeycomb mirror for the giant Magellan telescope. It takes you through the grinding and polishing, ending with a piece of glass unlike anything ever made before. 28 feet in diameter with a lightweight structure and a surface accurate to a millionth of an inch, so it can reflect light to form the sharpest possible images. We bond the load spreaders to the glass, then flip the mirror right side up and install it in a special support cell for the critical work on the front surface. Grinding and polishing the front surface are the final steps in the mirror fabrication. They make the mirror so smooth and accurate that if it were expanded to the size of North America, the tallest hill would be one inch high. We start with a machining operation to put in the correct shape to an accuracy of a thousandth of an inch. We still have to make the surface a thousand times more accurate to limit shape errors to a millionth of an inch. To measure the surface, we move the mirror from the polishing machine to the test tower. The most important measuring device is the interferometer, which illuminates the surface with laser light, collects the reflected light, and analyzes it to make a contour map of the surface with a resolution of a hundredth of a wavelength. We use a set of vacuum pads to lift it out of its support cell and onto a special frame designed for transport. Once the mirror is on the transport frame, it's enclosed in a steel box, which is lifted by crane and taken out of the mirror lab. Finally, the mirror is set on a flatbed trailer with special suspension to begin its journey to the telescope. Do you have any questions? I think that the uh, these two presentations were, or these two little uh, YouTubes were uh, very, very complete in, in how they described the process. And uh, there you go. Jerry, what was the mess up with the Hubble when they first put it out? They, uh, basically the idea was that uh, 
in the, uh, primarily in the secondary mirror, uh, they used the wrong target. It was a miscommunication between the people who made the uh, mirror and uh, and what it was supposed to be. <laughs> they just uh, basically messed up. Uh, it wasn't Perk and Elmer's uh, fault. I know the engineers there, and they were adamant about that. And they kept doing this blame game as far as what to do. But since the, uh, the problem was only a matter of curvature, that made it possible to send up a corrector. If they had made a, an error where, say, the mirror, instead of being nicely curved, had a little bit of this in it or something like that, there would be no correction. But when the mirror is beautiful, then you can put up another corrector and that's it. Basically, uh, if you have poor eyesight, if that's the only problem, you can wear glasses or contacts and correct for the right focus. And that was the whole thing. So it was just a matter of uh, uh, communication error. That's hard to believe with the United States government, but uh, it happens. Be curious. Where is this? Where, where is the uh, giant? Magellan telescope going to be, and when is it going to be uh, ready for uh, operations? Uh, all of the pieces, I think, uh, except for the last piece, are, are down in Chile right now. Uh, but it'll be on a mountaintop in Chile, uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, we can shoot another uh, uh, thing with an overview of Magellan. Uh, we've got that so. Some of it is a little redundant, but this is an eight minute. Extremely large telescopes is currently being planned and constructed. The lineup includes the giant Magellan telescope, an optical and near infrared telescope currently being built as part of the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. When finished, its primary mirror will consist of seven of the largest mirrors on the planet, each over eight meters in diameter. Oh, and when it observes bright objects, it won't produce any of those pesky diffraction spikes that every other telescope has to deal with. The GMT is being built as part of the US Extremely Large Telescope Program at a cost of about a billion dollars. It will sit 2,500 meters above the Atacama Desert, where the weather is almost always clear and the atmosphere is very stable, leading to incredibly good conditions for taking great astronomical observations. This mountain range is also home to the regular Magellan telescopes, which are a pair of 6.5 meter telescopes but they are giant like this new one will be, so we don't need to talk about them today. The GMT will have a segmented primary mirror that has a diameter of 25.448 meters. Of course, segmented mirrors are all the rage after the success of JWST, but since we aren't launching GMT into space, it can be way bigger. Each of the seven segments that will make up GMT have a diameter of 8.4 meters, and in total, the light collecting area will be 368 square meters. This makes these some of the largest mirrors on them, and it becomes almost impossible to make larger glass mirrors because they start to collapse under their own weight and stresses if they get much bigger. Just to put this in perspective, each one of those seven mirrors is larger than the total mirror side of all of JWST segments. And this means GMT will have four times the resolving power of JWST and 10 times the power of Hubble. Making and polishing these mirrors to the exact shapes they need to be is incredibly difficult and time consuming and takes several years to finish each one of them. At the time I'm filming this, three of the mirrors are completed and the central mirror is receiving the final polishing. Two more have been cast but not yet polished and the final two are yet to be stumped. This number actually includes a spare mirror as well that can be swapped in and out when the other ones need to be cleaned, repolished or recoated. 
The mirrors will be laid out with one in the center and six surrounding it, positioned perfectly to focus the light it receives onto the 1.1 meter secondary mirror, which itself will be made of seven segments, and these will be actively deformable to correct for atmospheric distortions of the incoming light. The good news is that observations from the telescope will actually begin with just four of the mirrors completed, and the final three will be added in as they get completed meaning that the first observations are actually expected in about 2029 or so. It will look at the first galaxies and stars, as well as the areas around black holes, helping us understand how the universe has evolved through time. Galaxies will be imaged up to 10 billion light years away, and will even be able to measure their rotation curves, measure galactic outflows of gas and dust, and look for star-forming regions and the clues of ionized gas, it should also be able to directly image some exoplanets. Jupiter-sized planets should be visible out to about 300 light years, and planets the size of Proxima b out to about 30 light years. That includes, of course, Proxima b itself. GMT will target many similar things to JWST, including the center of the Milky Way, but with better resolution and a different wavelength range. Perhaps the most interesting part of the telescope, though, at least before we see images from it, is an engineering decision that will improve those images. Other upcoming telescopes, like the 30-meter telescope or the extremely large telescope, yeah, that's its official name, will end up being larger than GMT, but they will all have to deal with diffraction spikes in their images, which is something that GMT has a unique way around and won't produce any of. These spikes are generally caused by two things. The first is the shape of the mirrors, but the much more impactful factor is the struts that are needed to hold the secondary mirror in place. They usually get in the way of incoming light, diffracting it and causing these spiky artifacts in images. They can be useful for us for identifying which telescope images have come from. For example, all JWST images famously have six big diffraction spikes, which we can use to identify images from that telescope. If you want the nitty gritty details of how the struts cause the spikes, then I have a full video all about that. So feel free to give that a watch, but be sure to come back and finish this one afterwards. Technically, there's actually a whole type of telescopes that don't produce diffraction spikes already. So why is this a big deal? Well, the ones that don't produce spikes are called refraction telescopes, and they don't rely on mirrors at all, so they have no need for the struts that cause the spikes. Instead, these telescopes focus light using a lens. This means, though, that these telescopes are essentially impossible to make larger than about a meter or so. Producing lenses of high enough quality any bigger than this is just too difficult, and the size and weight of these lenses is also prohibitively large. If these telescopes could be built without collapsing under their own weight, then they'd also be too heavy and cumbersome to do anything useful with. Hence, why all modern large telescopes are reflector ones that use mirrors to focus light, and all of those, therefore, need those troublesome struts. The way that GMT avoids the spikes is by making sure the struts that hold the secondary mirror in place don't block any light that gets collected by the primary mirror. That might sound like an impossible task, but the segmented nature and layout of GMT gives us a unique opportunity to get this right. You see, there are tiny gaps between the mirrors on the outside, so the secondary mirror will be held up by thin spider arms that line up perfectly with these gaps. This means that they block hardly any light that reaches the mirrors, and hence, no spikes. This almost sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. There are still small artifacts in the images. Not spikes, but rings of circular beads known as airy rings will appear in the images. These come from the gaps between the mirrors and also the fact that the spider arms do still block small parts of the central mirror. It turns out that this isn't enough to cause spikes, but it will cause these sort of odd rings. The reason that beads are better than spikes, though, is that they are way easier to get rid of and basically every image should be able to remove them. They get filled in and removed by simply taking a 15 minute or longer observation. And as the sky rotates overhead, the change in position will remove these rings because they're basically blank spots in the image where the telescope misses light from. The compromise is that there are gaps between the mirrors, meaning that we lose a little bit of collecting area. Effectively, we only have the collecting area that corresponds to a 22.5 meter mirror rather than the 25.4 meter it really is. This can be somewhat compensated for by taking longer exposures, 
and it will give us the first ever images of stars and other bright objects with incredibly high resolution, but no diffraction spikes blocking anything near those stars. Objects near the stars, of course, can include planets, so we definitely don't want to be missing any of those. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. And since you've made it to the end of the video, if you're new, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. Until next time. Next time's over. Uh, there were a lot of things there uh, toward the end of that one that, to my way of thinking, are a little overkill. Uh, we don't need to worry about that stuff. Uh, the engineers do. All we care about is that We've got telescopes being made that are bigger and bigger and bigger and more effective at gathering light. And as they gather more light, we can get more information. So let's finish uh, the video part here a little bit. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Go back to this. I wanted to show this. This is uh, one of the frames in the uh, videos that they just flashed up there. Uh, very briefly, what you have are uh, down here, we've got the Webb, the Hubble, and the Magellan telescopes here, here, and here. Just to show you again the size relationships, these other mirrors are again those myriad uh, mirrors that were also made at steward laboratories but they're all over the all over the world now they alluded to the fact that the giant magellan telescope is going to be uh replaced by the 30 meter and the extremely large telescope uh i added one little note up here for the 30 meter telescope, and that is that it's in trouble. Uh, it costs too much, and funding is uh, has placed it in jeopardy. And uh, there are also bureaucratic uh, uh, squabbling that is going on. And anytime you are talking about mirrors that uh, these arrays are going to be. Uh, billions of dollars, uh, you're going to have some squabbling, and uh, it's, it's a difficult thing. So uh, this is going to be, I think, uh, 2029, by the time the giant Magellan is uh, uh, it's in place and functioning. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we can make use of the web and the Hubble, and uh, that's not a bad compromise. So. Let's see what we can do. Now, the important thing that we want to do here is go back to being amateurs. And in order to be an amateur, you want to make use of your time. Now, whenever I decide to go out, and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have the, the handouts available, so I'm just going to describe this in brief. Uh, it's pretty much self-explanatory. Before I go out, I know exactly what I'm going to do. My telescope has been checked out. I take it out, set it up, and start looking at uh, what's up that night. We start with objects in the west because they're setting due to the Earth rotating. But we have objects that are in the west. If we wait until later on in the evening and look at other stuff first, they'll be gone. So we start in the west and work our way to the east. <clears throat> Fairly simple. On January the 2nd, which is coming up soon, 
Uh, I have on my list Alvirio, which is in Cygnus, low in the west. Lyra is low in the west. And uh, I've selected objects to, to go one to the next uh, and, and go across. Now, how did I figure out these, these objects? Well, I use a sky map and I use Stellarium. Want to know about Skylab and Stellarium? Yeah. Well, next month, on the first Tuesday, we will be talking about virtual astronomy. And part of virtual astronomy is planning uh, your viewing. And this is, this is really important. You have to look at these things as a uh, planning for a picnic, planning to go out and look at an eclipse. If you want to think ahead, make sure that you've got all the proper equipment and uh, everything in order. Uh, if I look at the sky maps for a given point in time, I can see the objects up there that I might want to see. I can also verify this or use Stellarium, which is a planetarium program, and uh, do the same thing. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of the, the planning of these objects because we'll do that next time. But you have you have to know that it's important. If you're going to have one of these things, it's also very important to recognize that when you go out, you need a checklist. Trust me, you need a checklist. There is nothing quite as <clears throat> upsetting and annoying. I know Brian has never had this problem, but I have, where you get out there and say, oh, I meant to bring that. Well, no, plan ahead. <clears throat> you want to have your telescope in the mount, you want your accessories, all your eyepieces, your green lasers. Why do you need a green laser? You have a telescope. You see, if Brian and I are out there and we don't have our green lasers, and I see something that I am curious about, if I say, uh, Brian, uh, what's that up there? Star, I think. Why? What? Where? What? What? And you have to communicate. If I got a green laser, what's that? And we can communicate. If I'm out with a group of people like you, and we're all hanging around a bunch of telescopes, and uh, I want to tell you something about the night sky, I want to draw constellations, I want to talk about deep sky objects, green laser, very important. If you're going to a big star party, they may tell you to keep your green laser in the car. That's okay. Not very often. We want red flashlights and red filter materials. Your night vision is important. So cover all your uh, flashlights with red film or a red filter. So you'll see all these red lights because the red light will not mess up your night vision. If you do mess up your night vision by looking at some white lights, it'll take you around 10, 15 minutes to fully develop your visual acuity for night, for night use. Okay. Warm clothing. Uh, my wife and I went to the Grand Canyon Star Party. It's in Arizona. That's where the Grand Canyon is. It gets cold at night. We didn't plan ahead. And you can't go to a store in Arizona and buy a winter coat. They don't have them. We ended up going to uh, a, uh, a Salvation Army type thing and uh, bought, a, bought some warm clothing for, I think, three, four dollars. Uh, dumb. But hey, it gets, it gets cold out there. You want to have a chair. You want to have a small table to put your stuff on. You don't want to be stumbling around in the dark uh, and 
and uh, tripping over things. So you have that. You want your list of objects to be viewed. You want your observation notebook, which of course keep keeps track of this list. The observation form. That's it. It's got the list in there. Check them off. And that's it. Do we have any questions on that? Okay. Well. Red flashlight. You buy separate flight red flashlight or just put film over the flashlight? Either hand? Uh, with all the star parties and, and, and public uh, viewing things, uh, I I have two different things that I uh, that I keep with me. About 30 years ago, I went to an auto flag, uh, auto supply store, uh, and I purchased uh, two rolls of uh, tail light repair tape, which is red and sticky on one side. And that works for the things in my car. Uh, all of my courtesy lights in my car have that coating on them. So uh, it looks like I'm driving a car of ill repute sometimes. <laughs> uh, when I get it. But uh, that way I can open my car doors at, at, at viewing sessions and then everything is, is red light protected. Okay. Uh, I did another one that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, kind of neat. I went to, uh, I believe it was Kmart at the time. Now Kmart's gone, but uh, uh, I went to uh, I went to a cheap place and I bought a red plastic tablecloth for picnics. It was a bright red tablecloth and it was a spur of the moment thing. And I said, "Wow, that's great!" So a dollar later. I have this red tablecloth. Now, red tablecloth is very large, but since I have my very own pair of scissors, I was able to take, make little squares, put those over the end of the flashlight, rubber band, I'm in good shape. Will it work? I'm not gonna go out at night to find out if it works. I go to a dark closet and see if I can read my sky maps in the dark closet and whether or not that red light is going to be right. You do this with everything that you do. Check it out first. And uh, it's all common sense uh, to, to a very large degree. But uh, yeah, we have we have some fun with, uh, with uh, cheap things. Uh, I made a, a viewer. Some of you saw this before. I used an old, uh, <clears throat> I used an old lens. Uh, this was a telephoto lens for a single lens reflex camera. Uh, I adjusted it so that uh, I could put eyepieces at one end. Uh, it's not really good for too many things. Uh, you can look at planets with it, you can look at the moon with it. That's all nice and dandy, but it really works well for eclipse viewing uh -huh. and for sunspot viewing. Uh, I saw this uh, uh, demonstrated on a, uh, a YouTube on the internet uh, a few weeks ago and I sent, uh, sent it off to Brian and said, I'm gonna make that. You have to use a funnel, big cheap funnel and uh, attach it to the eyepiece and then you, uh, you can get the sunlight coming in and out here, and then you have to put something at the end of this thing to, to do that. They recommended filter material, which if you purchase <coughs> online, you can get for about $40 a sheet. Uh, my wife suggested that I could uh, make my own, but they also said uh, you, if you don't want to do that, you can use a shower curtain or something. Well, I don't have a shower curtain that I want to sacrifice and make a big hole in because it leak. So uh, what I did was uh, I took my trusty Walmart bag and uh, used the plastic from the Walmart bag to uh, make a little screen. And now I get little visions, uh, little uh, projections of the sun on here, and it works great. It's about that big, shows all the sunspots, and it's neat as, as neat as you can be. Uh, this is a finder because you can't look at the sun. You have to have sunlight coming in here, make a little spot. You can 
And this thing works great. I've been uh, watching some spots now for the last several weeks, and uh, it's easy to adjust, find it, there it is. Works well. So you, you make use of some cheap material just to get you through. We had a, uh, a little bit of a presentation on one of the weekly uh, uh, blogs that I get from astronomy groups. And uh, one of the guys was talking about uh, telescopes and modifications. His admonition was that unless you've taken a drill to your telescope, you don't really know it. You, if you want to own the telescope, you've got to drill some holes. Uh, you've got to change them out. You've got to adjust it. You've got to be able to uh, make use of things. Up in northern Illinois, we used to consider the tele uh, telescope supply uh, uh, store that was local as uh, the Ace Hardware store. Uh, you're always messing around with things, and you can't be afraid to uh, uh, to, to move around with your, your telescope a little bit. Uh, Brian, do you, would you uh, tell us a little bit about your, your binoculars? Yes. Because we're going to start at the at the, at the bottom and work our way to the larger scale. Uh, with binoculars, you, you got the you, you usually know about maybe two numbers, all right? Uh, common binoculars that uh, people would have would be anything like the five power, which is the uh, magnification that you get with binoculars to the uh, the aperture. These are eighty millimeter, uh, more common. Binocular that you see is far or about 50 millimeter. So this is these are good for giving you a really wide field of view, looking up at the sky. Uh, this we'll put a little tripod um, gives it much more stability. Um, when you're looking at parts of the night sky that uh, have quite a few objects in them, uh, like right now you got the uh, constellation of Perseus and Cassiopeia overhead. You know, later in the evening, and uh, there's quite a few. Open star clusters in that area. Um, this something like this will let you get a, a good view. It'll even give you a really good view of how um, I many of you ever heard of the Lagoon Nebula. Um, constellation Sagittarius, best time of year, May June. Uh, it's usually kind of uh, low on the horizon, but you can get a good view of that part of Sagittarius where this huge nebula of uh, lots of the dust, and baryonic matter, all kinds of material. Where stars are being formed uh, in the sky, so so you can huge, you know, fairly easy to see nebula or something like this, even something smaller. Um, some of you guys may not know this. Uh, when you look up in this in the evening evening right now, the brightest object you see up there is Jupiter. Um, even with a pair of small binoculars, you know, the 50 millimeter average binocular, you can see Jupiter's four main moons. I mean, it's got 95 moons. That's what the count is up to right now, but it's got Four big ones that just over a period of an hour you can notice a movement orderly. Uh, sometimes uh, they'll go into the Jupiter shadow and it's like you're seeing four moons, then all of a sudden you just see three because it doesn't disappear when it's a Jupiter shadow, shadow that it casts back behind it. But um, these are uh, one of the ways that you use binoculars. Um, first thing you do is uh, you want to, when you look at film, you shut your right eye and you just use your left eye. And you focus it. This has got a focus uh, control right here. So you're just going to focus your left eye. Then you shut your left eye and you go over here on this side. Most binoculars have what's called a diopter on one side. All right. There are some that have them both. All right. But this will let you, next thing you know, you got your eye closed on this side and now you're using this to focus it. And then you open both eyes and you, you just you know, narrow it a little bit further. There is a process. Now, I think I used binoculars for probably 20 years before I uh, bought a pair. I just happened to pick a little uh, booklet out with it and start reading. It's like, oh, I didn't know this. It's like, to, to read the directions. <laughs> um, these are 20 power. Most binoculars, um, 10 power, 12 power. Uh, so you get a little bit, a little bit bigger image, but still, these Jupiter's still pretty small. You can tell Saturn's got. Got a band, got ring, rings around it. Uh, you can see a couple of moons on Saturn, around Saturn. 
What? Why do you have that on a tripod? I have this on a tripod to uh, something. A pair of binoculars like this is pretty unwieldy. All right. Um, when you, I mean, I've used these things for about 15 years. Okay. So I learned that when you use binoculars, and this even goes for, for smaller ones, um, you want to hold them way out here. Like the common thing people want to do is you want to grab right here and it makes it harder to balance it. So with these, the big binoculars, you want to hold them way out here and that'll even let you move back one hand and you know, get you know, fairly steady with it. This pretty much eliminates you know, uh, any kind of wobbling, you know, having to wobble around, having a hard time to keep it, keep it on target so that other people can take a peek through peek to, to get a, a good, uh, you know, good view of whatever you're looking at. This one here, one of the things that you, I had a problem with is when you get binoculars on a tripod, the centerpiece, well, I want this thing to go up high so that I can catch those things so I can be looking straight up if I need to be. So this but this tripod had, was a particular set up to have a extends much higher than than most uh, tripods do. So if you uh, if you're using your uh, bird watching binoculars, which is a common thing that almost everybody has, uh, and you want to uh, go out and look at the night sky, you'll find that after a while, when you get like me, you start doing this. And your back is going to start hurting, your neck is going to start hurting, and you're going to get tired of watching the stars after a very short period of time. If you want to do things where you're looking up at the sky at odd angles, whether or not it's a meteor shower or using your binoculars, get yourself a nice lounge and a blanket. And that's the way you do it. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a sore neck, sore back, or cold. So uh, that's that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, I've got a pair of 15 power binoculars that I thought would be just fine. But you get up there and you're wiggling all over the place. Any kind of wiggle at all with high power binoculars and you're gonna put them back in the, in the box. Uh, this this is the answer. Put them on a tripod, and uh, you can do it. With the uh, other uh, telescopes that we've got here, you've got all sorts of different arrangements with the Newtonian scope and that Zukov Cassegrain, uh, the refractor. Uh, we've got another one that we just took out of the, the, the bag here. It does a fine job. Uh, we've got that uh, uh, focused on the clock back there. We've got the uh, we've got the Galileo scope also focused on the clock back there. And if you have any questions or you want to uh, to look at any of these uh, telescopes, uh, I think that uh, we're at the point where we say, well, we can't cover all of them in detail, but we we can make them available. So. Uh, 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 since we're at the end of uh, the, the program and uh, our hour is uh, oh, just about up by only going over 10 minutes, uh, we'll, uh, we'll finish it up and uh, ask you to, uh, to take a look at the uh, telescopes that we've got up here. So we're, I think we're pretty well done. Thank you. Thank you.